Hello, welcome to this week's mega review, where we don't just review the movie, but everything that went into making the movie what it was. This week we are going to talk about Spider-Man 3, the final of the Sam Raimi trilogy, the beginning of the end of the Superman franchise, or perhaps the end of the beginning when we look at the new Spider-Man we're getting from the Marvel movies. But Spider-Man 3 is a film that lives in infamy. It's another movie that really demonstrates what I believe is the carryover of Effect. Which is, if you're a movie in a franchise that's following a successful one, you always build on and do better financially than the one before, even if your movie sucks. Bad movies follow good movies and do better. Good movies follow bad movies and do worse, even though they have much better quality. It's the carryover effect. So, if my theory is correct, Justice League better watch out. And this is why we have Spider-Man 3 being the highest grossing movie of 2007, but also the most despised out of the Sam Raimi movies. And it's a generally accepted consensus that the reason this movie is not as good as the ones become before it was more to do with Sony sticking its nose in and messing around with Sam Raimi's script. There's certainly a lot of evidence to suggest that, but I would also counter that as I said with Spider-Man 2, a lot of the problems that really bother people in this do still exist in the previous movies, it's just that there's enough good stuff to sort of outweigh it in those. This movie was the tipping point though, so I actually don't think it's a case that Spider-Man 3 was full of terrible stuff, just that it wasn't filled with as much good stuff as the others. The amount of badness and cringiness in this, pretty much equal as the other movies in my opinion, there's just not the good stuff to balance it out. And Spider-Man 3 was certainly thrown together fast. The release date for this was set even before Spider-Man 2 came out in cinemas. And immediately after Spider-Man 2 came out, Ivan Raimi, Sam Raimi's brother, began working on the treatment for this movie. So there was no like cooling off period for them, they just had to go straight into the next one. Which I think is a problem for any movie franchise. I think all movies need time to sort of wait and gauge the audience reaction before they jump right into the next one. But Sam Raimi wanted this film to really explore Peter learning that he's not as much of a, a sinless vigilante as he might have thought he was. And that there can also be humanity in some of the criminals that he's up against. And this is a running theme throughout Spider-Man 3, which is good guys can go bad and bad guys can go good. It affects pretty much everything in the movie, which in itself is a fantastic idea for a superhero story. It's been done very successfully multiple times with many different franchises. But of course, the devil's in the details. The critical reception was really not good. Roger Ebert said the film was a mess with too many villains, subplots, romantic misunderstandings, pointless conversations, and too many moments of the crowds looking up into the sky and shouting ooh, and then he said it was a shambles and that the film kind of makes up the rules as it goes along. Other critics have said that the three villains in this movie didn't even equal one Doc Ock. As you saw in my Spider-Man 2 review, I didn't think Doc Ock was a perfect villain either, and I don't think his flaws are any worse than any of these villains, it's just there's three of them. Sam Raimi was extremely unhappy with how the film turned out, and he had actually hoped that he'd be able to iron out some of these problems in Spider-Man 4, but as we know, that eventually became The Amazing Spider-Man in a reboot. But we'll cover a bit more of that in detail when we do the mega review of that. But not only did Sam Raimi actually want a fourth installment, but even a fifth and possibly a sixth installment were planned. It's really interesting to think what could have happened, where we could have gone with the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man if they had made that many movies. Oh, what could have been? Originally Dylan Baker's Kurt Connors was meant to mutate into the lizard and become the main villain in this film. That's why they planted him in the last film to set up for that turn. But that was shelved and then at one point Raimi wanted to bring in Ben Kingsley as the Vulture before that was shelved as well. Because it was insisted upon by the producers that they had to include Venom because they knew that Venom had a very strong fan base. Sadly though they didn't realise that to the fan base throwing in Venom and not doing him well is actually worse than never doing him at all. Thomas Hayden Church, who plays Sandman, revealed in an interview that he actually broke three of his knuckles during the subway scene where he was supposed to swing a punch at Spider-Man and smash it through a wall. The special effects guys told him that the brick he was supposed to punch was only foam and that he could punch through it but all the bricks around it were real. Unfortunately when it came time to film they forgot to put in the foam one so Thomas Church just turned around and punched full force a real brick breaking three of his knuckles. Pretty big oversight there. 
there, guys. Apparently, one of the sounds used for Venom is actually of the Tasmanian Devil. <laughs> This movie also introducing Gwen Stacy is ironic because on the one hand we've got Kirsten Dunst, who is a natural blonde playing a redhead Mary Jane, while Bryce Dallas Howard, who is a natural redhead, is here playing Gwen Stacy, who is supposed to be blonde. Thomas Hayden Church also worked out for about 16 months to build up his physique in order to portray Sandman. Topher Grace apparently also worked out for about six months to prepare for his role as Venom, but he claims he did gain 24 pounds of muscle, even though you couldn't tell he's just so skinny all the time. The time. But Topher Grace said he actually based his performance as Eddie Brock off alcoholics and drug addicts and the way that they act. So I'm sure Topher Grace did a lot of uh, research into that part of the role. In Russia, the title of the film was translated as Spider-Man 3 Enemy in the Reflection, which is actually a pretty damn good name. So the movie starts with things going much, much better for Peto. In fact, pretty much everything's going well for him, kind of the exact opposite of the last movie. Things are also going well for MJ, at least in the beginning of the movie. She's quickly fired from her Broadway play because apparently she sings terrible. They say that falling in love is wonderful. Really? She sounded pretty good to me. I look at these words. It's like my father wrote them. Yeah, you know, I think MJ actually might have a few daddy issues going on. That would probably explain why she switched five boyfriends in only three movies. Even to the point where now she's cycling all the way back in this movie to Harry again. She's actually a bit of a skank, really. I mean, she can't go five minutes without having a man in her life. Kind of makes it ridiculous that Peter's crying all the time when he thinks he's going to lose her. Dude, just wait. Your turn in the rotation will pop up again. But I think the Peter-MJ relationship in this is one of the massive, massive missteps of this movie. They just don't tell each other anything, even though there's no reason they shouldn't. I mean, MJ already knows that Peter is Spider-Man. She already knows his biggest secret, so he should have no reason whatsoever to hold anything back from her. Yet he never actually tells her the whole situation with Harry and his father and the Green Goblin and all the rest of it. Why not? Those things are kind of important, and I'm sure she can handle them. If she can handle you being Spider-Man, she could handle him being Green Goblin and she might even be able to talk some sense into him so you don't end up killing each other. And this entire love triangle springing up between the three of them is a huge mistake in my opinion. In the first movie Harry ended up dating MJ and it didn't come between them as friends. You should know I'm crazy about her. It's just you know you never made a move. You're right. And in the second movie when he started dating Mary Jane it didn't come between them then either. Hey buddy. Hey. Long time no see. Well, except when Harry was drunk, I guess, but you know, he's drunk, whatever. So for them all still at this point to be having this whole love triangle thing is just wrong. Although I have to admit, I did kind of enjoy watching Harry sort of Shawshanking MJ there. Yeah, do you guys know what that is? Shawshanking? Let, let me explain. Shawshanking is a situation where you like a girl but she's already with a guy but you know it's not going to last very long so just like in the movie Shawshank Redemption where he tunneled out of prison just little by little just slowly chipping away at the wall just making this tunnel little by little over a long period of time he escaped in the same kind of way you can sort of chip away at this other person's relationship just little by little so eventually you can get the girl. Peter actually Shawshanked MJ from Harry in the first movie and now Harry is returning the favor over here, which he seems to be doing even before the goblin psychosis takes him over again. After he gets hit in the head and loses all his memories and becomes good Harry again, apparently he forgets that Peter and MJ are a couple because he immediately starts cracking onto her again. Does he not remember they're together or does he just not care? I mean, after he gets all his memory back and becomes the goblin again, he doesn't care at that point. But what about before it? There's a lot of inconsistency there. And there's even more inconsistency with Peter Parker. He kind of does the same thing. At the big Spider-Man celebration, he kisses Gwen Stacy with MJ there in the audience, and afterwards he doesn't even seem to register that it's wrong. 
If he was doing that after he was affected by the Venom symbiote, I would totally get that, but at this point it hasn't even touched him yet. That's a pretty big leap for his character. I mean, I can, can get behind the idea that now that the city's celebrating him, it's gone to his head a little bit, so he's a little bit self-centered, he's a little bit selfish, he's a little bit of a jerk. I totally buy that. But kissing another woman right in front of your girlfriend and then not even thinking anything of it later on, that's like serial killer kind of stuff, man. <laughs> Gwen Stacy talks about Spider-Man kissing her right in front of MJ and it still doesn't connect in his head what her problem is. Which actually reminds me, Pete, if you've got a picture of my kiss with Spider-Man, could you bring it to class? When you kissed her, who was kissing her? Spider-Man or Peter? What do you mean? You know exactly what I mean. You don't know what her problem is? How could you not know? How can he not know? How can he not know? I mean, I get that Peter is supposed to have his head in the clouds and kind of be oblivious to what's going on, but he's oblivious in this to the point of almost having something mentally wrong with him. There's just a lot of bizarre things that happen in this movie, and there's so many moments of characters just acting in ways that no human beings would ever act. And this affects MJ as well. You can see this in the whole breakup scene with Peter Parker. Let's just look at this whole scenario from her situation. She's going through difficult times. Peter Parker's not being particularly surprised. Supportive, so she goes off and starts flirting with Harry Osborne because she's a tart. They're making eggs together, dancing the twist, being total idiots, and then presumably only hours later, he's freaking out, grabbing her, slamming her against the wall, saying that he's going to kill Peter Parker. And remember, she knows that Harry has just suffered a serious head injury. Now, wouldn't you, as a friend, if a friend of yours was friendly with you one minute and then almost killing you the next, wouldn't you assume that maybe his brain got damaged in the head injury? Of course you would, anyone would. She'd go to Peter Parker and say, I think Harry's really injured, I think his brain might be damaged, he's acting so strangely, we need to get him into the hospital and see if he's okay. But instead, she decides to break up with him in order to protect him. MJ, he's Spider-Man. He doesn't need protecting. He can protect himself. He already beat the crap out of Harry Osborn. You don't need to protect him from Harry or anyone else. And does she not remember that Green Goblin almost killed her in the first movie and now he's Harry Osborn wearing the almost exact same outfit with the hoverboard. She can't put two and two together that maybe something's going on here. All the more reason to tell Peter Parker the truth about what happened. It just, it, it blows my mind. Raimi's idea with Harry Osborn was that he doesn't fully follow his father's legacy. He's sort of halfway in between that and being a good guy. And he does sort of bounce back and forth as per the theme of this movie. But again, that raises so many questions. We see early in the movie, Harry taking the, the goal goblin gas that gives him the, the extra strength and stamina and all the rest of it that his father used but it also has the same side effect that it gave his father which is he starts to go crazy so on the one hand we've got harry completely going insane like his father did but then on the other hand all it takes is one short conversation with his butler about how his dad accidentally killed himself and oh he's totally cured all that insanity is just drifted away now no i'm sorry but norman osborn if someone had tried to talk to him like that probably this would have happened So Harry probably should have just killed his butler there. That would have been in character. And it would have been good. We wouldn't have to put up with this terrible performance. The night your father died, I cleaned his wound. The blade that pierced his body came from his glider. There's no question your father died by his own hand. You are so fired. W what? You've known that all this time. Uh, and you picked now to tell me? I thought this would be the best time to tell you the truth. I took a grenade to the face, dude! It's this kind of weird in-between where they're not quite this but they're not quite that that infects every single character in this movie and really ruins it. But I do have to admit, it was definitely heartwarming to see Peter Parker and Harry teaming up at the end there, becoming friends again, and even just during the amnesia section of the movie. It was good to see them just kind of being buddies again. You have lovely friends. My best friends. I'd give my life for them. 
Mmm, yeah, that's some subtle foreshadowing, Sam Raimi. You know, Goblin does actually have the ability to make the board fly towards him. So he could have literally just pressed a button on his wrist and the board would have flown out of Venom's hand back towards him again. So there was really no need whatsoever for him to dive in front of the blades. But it is interesting that he and both his father have now died from their own gliders. Those things are just as dangerous as capes in The Incredibles. Meta Man, Express Elevator, Dino Guy, Snag on Takeoff, Splash Down, Sucked into a Vortex, No Kicks! It's also very frustrating to see Spider-Man continue to make the same mistakes that he's already learned from in the previous movies. Like after Harry loses all his memory, they're back to square one again. So the whole issue that came between them of him not telling Harry the truth about what happened to his father, he's got another chance now to set that right. He's got another chance to sit him down and explain properly how his father died, why his father died, but instead he just makes the same mistake he's did before which is never bother to even tell him and let him find out some other way so that he freaks out and turns into a villain. And what about, oh my god, when he finds out that Sandman is actually the guy who shot Uncle Ben, he goes out with a vengeance ready to kill the guy, which is exactly the lesson that he learned not to do in the very first movie. The whole point of that was he learns with great power comes great responsibility, and now he just repeats the exact same mistake again. It makes it laughable when later on he tries to condemn Sandman man for taking a life. We always have a choice. You had a choice when you killed my uncle. Yeah, Spider-Man, and you had a choice when you killed Sandman. As far as you were concerned, he was dead right there. You killed him and you made that choice. Yeah, yeah, I know, the Venom symbiote, all the rest of it. But he managed to overpower it through sheer willpower after he knocked over Gwen Stacy. But apparently, from his point of view, killing two different people, one of them being his oldest friend of his entire life, that was not enough to snap him out of it. But oh, you accidentally backhand Gwen Stacy and oh, yep, no, now he can snap out of it. And the nerdiness of Peter Parker, oh my god. I know he's supposed to be nerdy, but he is so nerdy in this that it actually kind of makes it refreshing to see him turn evil until the whole dance sequence, of course, because it gives us a break from all the, the cringiness of how childish he is. Wasn't the whole point of Spider-Man 2 that he grows up and he takes responsibility? Why is he still acting like a child? That's, that's really what he is. He's like a child. He acts like a child. He talks like a child. He thinks like a child. He makes decisions like a child. He's unaware of his surroundings or other people around him just like a child. What is he, retarded? Sandman, I believe, is actually done pretty well. He is an interesting character. I do wish they would have maybe smoothed out the contours of his story a bit. But personally, I really like the idea of him being a misunderstood villain who's still kind of got a good heart but doesn't really know how else to do what he needs to do to save his daughter. I mean, we don't get any kind of answer about why he couldn't like just get a night job or something like that or, or maybe apply to some kind of charity to help his daughter out. But I don't know, they just skip over all that stuff. But the point is he's supposed to be like a misunderstood monster. And Thomas Hayden Church did actually base a lot of his performance off misunderstood monsters from different fiction like Frankenstein or King Kong. And you really can see that in like his posture and the way he walks and some of his movements. It's a pretty good performance overall. In the comics, Sandman is mostly just a petty criminal, but for this movie, the decision was made to change his backstory being that he's the real person who killed Uncle Ben, with the idea being that it challenges Peter Parker's perception of what happened, that the situation was actually much more complicated than he thought it was, and it plugs into that whole larger theme of forgiveness for everyone. I forgive you. Yeah, he's probably just gonna go keep robbing stuff, Spider-Man. It's great you forgive him, but doesn't really solve his situation. If he had turned himself in, and maybe Dr. Connors had come up with a cure for the girl, then perhaps that would have been a satisfying ending, but not here. He's also one of the few villains that doesn't have a split personality in this franchise. Although he may as well have, considering how much he flip-flops between being a good guy and a bad guy in these movies. I mean, he starts out being a good guy, then he becomes bad, robbing the armored car, almost killing all of these guards. In fact, they probably would have crashed and killed even more innocent people if Spider-Man had not pulled them out. But then after his battle with Spider-Man, he suddenly turns good again. Penny.
Oh, but not for long, because now he's a bad guy again. I want to kill the spider. You want to kill the spider. Together, he doesn't stand a chance. Interested? Yeah. And then one last flip to him being a good guy at the end. Seriously, this is a situation where you actually could have given him a split personality to make some sense of all this flip-flopping. It always bothered me just how bad he gets there at the end. He goes from being the reluctant thief to just overtly wanting to murder Spider-Man, presumably only because he got in his way before. Spider-Man does think he's dead, right? So he's kind of got a clean slate here. He could just move to a new city and start stealing stuff there. He doesn't really need to go after him and try and kill him. If they had written in something where maybe he had stolen medicine that his daughter was gonna need and Black Suit Spider-Man smashed it during the fight and then the daughter died, then it would make sense him going full villain because he wants revenge for his daughter's death. Or maybe there's a misunderstanding where he thinks his daughter died because of it and then turns out she didn't. I don't know, but apparently in an early version of the script, the daughter was supposed to show up at the fight at the end and talk him out of it, basically say, I don't want my dad to be a bad guy like this. And that's why he sort of turns good there. For some reason they left that out, I don't know why, that would have been good. An alternative scene though for how he and Venom meets was going to be that Sandman is actually pretending to be the sand in a playground that his daughter is in there building a sand castle out of. The idea being that that's the only way he can sort of be near his daughter is that when she's playing in the sandbox he is the sand. So he's kind of playing with her in a way. But Eddie somehow manages to convince him that he can save his daughter from whatever sickness she has, I don't know, they never say what it is. But that's why he's willing to kill in order to save his daughter's life. Like, again, that'd make sense, but they cut it out. But despite all the problems with the way the character is written, I do really like the way he's played. And there's no doubt that the birth of Sandman, him forming out of that sand, is a fantastic scene. The whole way it's shot, the, the music is really good, it's emotional. It actually took them about six full months just to do that one scene. It's really something very special. Oh yes, the biggest bone of contention that most people have with Spider-Man 3 is the way it handled Venom. A huge missed opportunity here. Sam Raimi originally didn't want to have Venom in the movie at all. He didn't really care for the character because he felt that being such a hardcore villain, there was a real lack of humanity there and it just wouldn't fit in with the overall theme that he wanted to have. But he was eventually forced to put Venom in purely for fan service and we all know how bad that always turns out. Apparently though, over the course of researching Venom, he did begin to appreciate the character a lot more. The film's version of Venom is supposed to be an amalgamation of a couple of different Venom storylines. But the Eddie Brock side of Venom is supposed to be like a shadowy version of Peter Parker. They have the same job, similar builds, kind of dating the same kind of girls. Eddie Brock's just a, a darker version and we see that in that when Peter Parker gets the Venom symbiote on him, he starts to act a lot more like Eddie Brock. Uh, we see the difference between them in the way they do their job where Peter is more like a journalist and Brock is more like the paparazzi. But the introduction of Venom just reeks of pure laziness on a part of the studio. He literally just falls into the movie on a meteorite right next to Peter Parker. Gee, what a coincidence. Originally, it was supposed to be that John Jameson, the astronaut that MJ was engaged to in Spider-Man 2, he was going to bring the symbiote to Earth as like a stowaway on board his ship unintentionally. And then from him, it was going to go to J. Jonas Jameson and then over to Peter. So it makes more sense as to how it would end up in Peter's sphere of influence, so to speak. But they literally changed it just to save money. Oh, just have a meteorite fall out of the sky. That's all you need. They don't even explain what the symbiote really is or where it comes from. What a waste. What a waste of a fantastic character and a fantastic idea. They really should have given him his own movie 
movie. I'd really like to see Eddie Brock Venom in the Marvel Universe at some point. I don't know whether the rights to Venom also went across with Spider-Man or what have you, but we really need a proper version of Venom. When the symbiote gets on Peter Parker though, as I've said, I actually kind of enjoy it. Just because I think we all enjoy seeing these characters that are just enjoying being evil so much. It's just a shame that for some reason the symbiote turns him into the mask. There were a few other scenes with the black suit Spider-Man that apparently were filmed but never made it onto the DVDs and I wasn't able to find them anyway so if anyone is able to find them please let me know. But there was going to be a montage of black suit Spider-Man stopping criminals in his extra brutal extra sadistic kind of way and also a moment where Peter looks in the mirror and sees this nightmarish version of Venom screaming back at him from the mirror's reflection. Hey maybe that's where the Russian subtitle came from but perhaps we did finally get to see that shot in particular towards the end of the movie when Venom is separated from Eddie Brock. So guys next week's video I can either continue doing the Spider-Man franchise, I can do the Amazing Spider-Man or I can jump over to Alien 3. I'd personally like to jump over to Alien 3 just to mix it up you know. But hey it's up to you guys whichever one gets the most amount of votes that's what I'll do next week. So click on the card in the top right corner and let me know what you guys want. So Spider-Man 3 gets a lot of hate and a lot of it is deserving. But I don't think we can really blame Sony as much for ruining this movie as much as they did ruin the subsequent two movies after it. This one, I think a fair share of the blame should actually be laid at the feet of Sam Raimi. The characters have always been kind of badly written and kind of shallow. There's always been really cheesy, cringeworthy stuff. But I think Sam Raimi just struck out this time. And there's no shame in that. Everybody strikes out from time to time. And there's no doubt that Sam Raimi is an incredible director and has had an amazing career. And there's still plenty of good stuff here in Spider-Man 3 to enjoy, but as Roger Ebert said, Venom is just one villain too many. So thanks for watching. If you want to catch other videos from me, you can click on any of the cards you see right here on the screen. I am Bandit, this is Bandit Incorporated, and until next time I will see you guys in the comments.